Good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you for Monday Morning Devotions. We're back at Monday once again. And um, we, uh, we, get to, um, we get to reflect a bit today in our devotions. There is a, a bit of time of, of uh, looking back at, uh, at some things that have happened as we've looked through the, the book so far. And, and that, I mean, that usually happens where, uh, where pieces build on other uh, pieces in a, in a book, in a narrative. It happens uh, in this uh, apocalyptic literature that John's writing in also. But one of the things that is, uh, is helpful to remember, um, I think, first of all, the, the book of Revelation is at the end of the Bible, right? It's the last one. And, uh, and it helps us to uh, summarize or, 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 uh, or capture everything else that has come before. So from Genesis through Jude, <laughs> all that is building up to this book that we have. And, uh, but reading all of those and bringing in the, um, the truth of all of those books, all of those volumes, all those things that have been written, all that proclamation of Christ, all of that promise fulfilled. The, uh, then when you get to the book of Revelation, now you get some, um, you get some of, you, you get to see the the picture in its fullness uh as as it's written in this you know cryptic style so um we're going to try to do some unpacking unfolding a little bit today and uh in this section in uh, revelation 14 because there are so many connections back to other places in scripture that help inform and help us understand what's happening in revelation 14 without all those you're, if you just read the book of Revelation, if that's the only book you read in the Bible, it's very confusing. Not much understanding can happen because of the uh, metaphor and illusion that's happening here. So, um, but as we bring it into the, the language and the connection that's happening in, uh, in Revelation, pointing back to so many different things, then we get the fuller picture. So that's what we'll do a little bit of today. It's kind of a a recap episode a little bit, um, but there is something really cool in the middle of uh, of this section. Those gathered in heaven sing a new song. They sing a song to the Lamb, and there are some good hymns that uh, reflect on that. Uh, there was one that I was really going to pick, um, but then I realized it goes even better with Revelation chapter 19, so we're going to save it, um, but my song is Love Unknown, and eh, has this uh, this sense of us singing a word of proclamation that rejoices in who Christ is. And so that's what we'll sing today. Number 430, and we're going to sing stanzas 1, 2, and 7, the last one. 1, 2, and 7. My song is love unknown. My Savior's love to me, love to the loveless shown that they might lovely be. Oh, who am I that for my sake my Lord should take frail flesh and die? He came from his blessed throne, salvation to bestow, but men made strange and none the long for Christ would know. But, O oh, my friend, my friend indeed, who at my need his life did spend, here might I stay and sing No story so divine Never was love, dear King Never was grief like thine This is my friend In whose sweet praise I all my days could gladly spend so we hear about that new song from Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 
144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps, and they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. This is the word of the Lord. All right, a lot going on here. So uh, I'm kind of going to just tick through um, through these kind of uh, linearly, um, a little more of a teaching style devotion than a devotionally devotion. I guess you could think of it this way. Um, so, because I think it's helpful if we look at each of these um, these words, these allusions, these pictures, and uh, and see how they are are found in Scripture and and then drawn back out. So we get um, the idea of Mount Zion, right? And this is. Uh, um, described as, uh, in some places in scripture, as the, the physical location of Jerusalem. But also, like in Psalm 2, we get this understanding of it being the place where the Messiah reigns with his people, where Christ is with those he has redeemed. And so um, we get that in a sense of a, you know, it doesn't have to be a location, but it is wherever Jesus is gathered with his people as they are surrounded with his word, with his sacraments, as he is bringing grace to his people. And so we can even look at the, the gathered church on earth as this idea of Mount Zion when God is there with his people. So this Mount Zion idea captures this image of the place where God's central king, the one king of kings, rules together with his people as they are gathered in his name. Okay, so that's who's, that's that's that place. And then there stands the lamb, and we've uh, understood this in lots of places, like chapter 5, uh, where this is Jesus, the lamb who was slain. And then, uh, and then the 144,000, we get the 144,000, right, in chapter 7. This is that triumphant, or I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the church militant, the church on earth, God's whole church of people who are waiting to be brought into the church triumphant. And that's the picture here too. They are people who uh, Jesus is bringing, he's gathered with them, and he's bringing them into his nearer presence with those who have been gathered around the throne. So God's people are being brought to himself. And as we've been looking at this, this idea of um, these these trumpets, right? This is that uh, um, that the, we're in that second uh, you know cycle of images as uh, as these these trumpets are being blown, and uh, and so we're kind of in the midst of that still, and, and trying to see how this fits along with the 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 beasts who have come before um, that that Pastor Nunder and uh, Karen were talking about last week and then he said Pastor Rago gets to jump into some good stuff that's true because this is those hundred forty four thousand are those who have um, been through trials and the temptations of Satan and the, really the the falsehood of uh, of other narratives that are not what God has said against his truth. And, uh, and so all those other things, they've been through that. And now they're gathered with the lamb and they have had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. This goes uh, is a good allusion to Matthew 28, right? Jesus talks about us being um, baptized into the name of the father and of the son and the Holy Spirit. We've had that name placed on our heads 
Uh, when we have baptisms, uh, we say, Receive the sign of the Holy, Holy Cross, both upon your forehead and upon your heart, to mark you as one redeemed by Jesus Christ the crucified. Here the, those are, those gathered here. That's who it is, those who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And so we get that throughout the idea of Revelation 2, you know, the white robes that we wear and the white that is connected to baptism too. All this comes together here. And so uh, then, those are the people who are gathered here, that a church on earth. And John hears, then, the church in heaven bringing about sound and music and a new song. And he describes them in these ways, which are interesting because of the way that um, these, these phrases have been used across the book of Revelation already, right? We have the roar of waters, the sound as the voice of a roar of waters. This has already been ascribed to God and his voice in chapter one. We get the sound of thunder, and that's already been described as the voice of God in, in chapter 10. Um, and then we get the, those who are playing harps. We get this in chapter five of those elders who are gathered with the four living creatures around God's throne in chapter five. And so, um, but it isn't God who is speaking this, but this is, this is the voice of God's church who say the same thing and speak the same truth that he speaks in this song that they proclaim. And they sing this new song. And this is the song that has been sung since Jesus' ascension into heaven. We get that sense as um, we see as the, the, the lamb takes his place on the throne, right? This would be Jesus' ascension. And so then, uh, then this song has been sung since then. And now the song is being taught to the 144,000 as they gather together around this throne. And there's, um, uh, in, in chapter 5, if you recall, there's the place where they are also, the, these elders, four living creatures, are around the throne. They're singing this new song, right? Worthy is the Lamb. Uh, worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals. That idea. Uh, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You've made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. So we get this proclamation of who Jesus is as he's got as he gathers his people to himself this is that proclamation of the new song which contrasts not contrasts but maybe fulfills the idea of song as we have throughout the bible we have the the uh, the idea of the old song which would have been the song of Moses that is sung in Exodus 15 as Israel is brought out of the, the slavery in Egypt. They cross the Red Sea and now they are on the other side and into this idea of God bringing them from this situation of death to life. We get the new song in, uh, in Nehemiah 12. It talks about the people singing uh, the idea of a new song as they are brought out of their exile and now are returning to Jerusalem as they're gathered together as God's people. Now here in Revelation 14, as we saw in Revelation 5, this new song is the triumphant song as God's people are brought together for their final redemption through Jesus. So we see this idea of building of, uh, of God at work for his people. And we as Christians sing the song of God's people uh, as we gather together in worship. This is why singing in church, singing for God's people is such a big idea because um, it has been throughout scripture. And as we gather together in Christ and in his name regularly, we then sing songs praising his name, saying the same thing that he has said. So our songs echo scripture. They speak those scriptural truths. They point to Jesus. So our songs are Christological. That means they point to the Messiah, Jesus, the Christ. Um, and so that is the one song that is the most uh, worthwhile to sing. And so as we gather to, as God's church, we sing, and we know that this is true, for God's people as they proclaim his truth in, uh, in his kingdom. So then as they, uh, um, as they sing and as they're gathered, verse 4 now gets into uh, a couple things that are helpful to, uh, to understand. 
um, where it says these are people who have not defiled themselves with women for they are virgins. So the, the, the idea of here is male virgins. And, uh, and this throughout scripture um, has a, an, a, a fulfillment of, uh, of purity and holiness that God gives and he desires for his people. And it's one that we receive because of Jesus for us. So um, men uh, in, um, in battle, there's many places across the Old Testament, as they prepare themselves for battle, they would refrain from sexual relations to set themselves apart for the work of Yahweh. The um, um, Israelites, as they're about to leave Egypt, they refrain from sexual relations as they are getting ready for what God is going to do for them. Here, so it doesn't mean like, um, here, like, make sure you don't get married, because uh, that put me out. I couldn't be part of this 144,000 if I was a male virgin here. Um, this idea is those whom Jesus has made pure and without blemish, because um, the idea of being not a virgin in, that, uh, in this context throughout Scripture, too, Old Testament and New, is those who have gone and pursued relationships with other gods and not had this pure relationship with Yahweh. And so, as we see these here, these are the ones who have faith in Christ, who are holy and pure in God's sight, and they follow the Lamb. I love this image of those who have um, been made new in the Lamb, and so they follow the Lamb. As Jesus calls out, like in Mark, or Matthew chapter 4, right? he calls his disciples and he calls them to follow me. And this is a lifelong pursuit, right? A lifelong following of what Jesus calls us to do as we follow him in life and in his kingdom and all that he uh, uses us to do as we are in this, this church militant, the time where we're on earth. But then as we're gathered together, we are called the, these first fruits, right? The ones who are gathered ripe for the harvest. This has echoes from, uh, from Leviticus 23 and the feasts of Israel as God desires to gather his people into his presence as those who have been um, made ready to receive into his kingdom. And so we're uh, like this idea of a, of a living sacrifice that, uh, that offer up ourselves for the work of God on the earth. And it's an act of worship as we uh, live lives that are wholly committed to what God has done. Now, all this is idealistic, right? This is those people um, who never lie and they never blaspheme right at the end here. They're blameless. And uh, I can't say that of myself, right? I have, wouldn't, couldn't say I have no lies in my mouth or I am completely blameless or all my life daily is an act of worship. But this is who Christ has made these people to be, right? He is the one who has no deceit in his mouth from Isaiah 53 and John 8. And Jesus points out in John 8, Satan is the one who is the father of lies. But we have been given pure speech and a new word to sing and, uh, and been called blameless because of Jesus' righteousness, which has been placed on us. So for all of these people, right, this 144,000, all Christians on earth, all those who are waiting to join Christ, it's a joy to see this scene because it's all what Jesus has done for his people as he gathers us to himself and we join together and sing praises to his name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have sent your son for us. And we rejoice in all that he has done. And as we see this scene, it once again gives us joy and a glimpse of what you will call us to. To being who you call us to be today. That uh, the church that follows Jesus and that speaks his truth and that has lives that are acts of worship as living sacrifices in his name. We also look forward to the day where our praises sung will be in your fullest presence as we join your church in heaven and we are placed in your new creation to sing that praise in your presence forevermore. Lord, 
Thank you for these words as we are comforted and look forward to that great day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.